We are in our Kindred series, and we are on the fifth week of our Kindred series, and Greg this week is uh, speaking at a Mennonite conference out in Ohio. Now, I have to tell you something about Greg Boyd. You know, we've been with him for quite some time. He loses his shoes. I don't know if you've ever noticed that up front. He loses his keys. Yesterday, he was at the airport and waiting to board the flight, and they said, uh, the flight will be delayed. Actually, we can't find the airplane. So now he can add to his list, he's lost an airplane. So <laughs> Greg, though, did make it out there, and he is speaking there. So today, we get to have Steve Weens, who is uh, a good friend of ours from Open Door, and he is going to share part of the Kindred series with you. But he asked me to read the scripture beforehand. So if you turn in your Bibles, we're going to read out of Acts 3, 1 through 8, and you can also follow along on the screen. Let's read the word. The, the word of the Lord. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, when Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by his right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Then he went into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Hey, everyone. Yeah. So fun to be back. How are you guys? Very good to see you. Uh, so that text that Mary just read uh, is fascinating to me on so many levels. You have Peter and John walking up like they always do up to the uh, temple. They go through the gate that is called Beautiful. Keep that picture and image in your mind. It's the author's hint and wink about what the story is really all about. And Peter and John pass by this guy that they probably pass by dozens of times, maybe more. But this day, something completely different happens. And Peter, all 21 years of his experience, looks down at this guy who asks him for money, and he says this phrase that I just cannot get out of my mind. He says, silver and gold I do not have. I don't have any money, but what I do have, I freely give. And so this question that comes to my mind, what does it mean? to really know what you have to offer? What does it mean to really have it? And what does it mean to know what you don't have to offer and what doesn't help? You ready to talk about that this morning? Yeah. All right. Well, let's pray, and then we'll dive into that. God, we pray for Greg this morning as he's teaching in Ohio that your spirit would be alive and active and on him. And we pray right now that your spirit would be released to uh, invite us into a life in God that we didn't know was possible. A life in God that is um, centered in the resurrection of your son, Jesus. A life that is empowered to do things that we never thought we could do a life that is empowered to give away you in the world. Amen. So uh, I have a question that I want to ask you, and the question is, what do you have to offer? And that's kind of maybe weird of me to ask you, right? Maybe a little rude, a little over the top. We don't even know each other, really. But if we were sitting down at a coffee shop and I asked you, so, like, what do you have to offer in this world? What would you say? 
Now, I think we have a lot of things that we have naturally to offer, and think of it like a piggy bank inside of ourselves, or maybe we are a piggy bank, and these are all the things that you and I have to offer. These are real things that we need to offer, real things that uh, really help people, things like your wisdom. Some of you have wisdom to offer, and you need to give it. Some of you have your experience. Some of you have charm. I mean, some of you need to offer charm to the world so that the world might have a smile on a Monday morning. I mean, that would be a good thing. So you have money to offer, and that's good. If you have money, you need to offer that money. Like to this church, I saw the budget statement on the back of the, of, of, of the bulletin. Uh, some of you need to offer your money. Some of you need to offer your ideas, your energy, your influence. I get really excited when I hear about this big building being used for things other than just Sunday mornings and Saturday nights, that now there's a food shelf that is incredible, that uh, right now that you're using this month to give people a place to sleep because it's five degrees outside. I mean, that is amazing that you have a building to offer and you're offering it. That is wonderful and you need to offer those things. But the next question that comes up for me and maybe should come up for you is this, what about when what you offer is just not enough? Or when what you offer runs out? Have you ever experienced that? You've been in a situation where you offer your wisdom, you offer all the wisdom you have, and there's nothing left, and the other person is sitting across from the table from you going, all right, I'm still totally stuck. When your money runs out, when your ideas run out, when the need that you're facing across the table from you, or maybe even in your own heart, is so big that you realize, I can crack that piggy bank open, and I can rummage around for more money or more wisdom or more experience, and it's just not going to help because the need is way too big. Have you ever been there? What do you do when you get there? I want to read this story to you. The story that Mary just read, but I want to read it from a different perspective. I want to read it to you from the perspective of the man that was laying by the gate called Beautiful, the man that was lame. Because I think in this story, what we find really connects to this series that you're in, Kindred. Because uh, one of the things, and, and Greg has been encouraging you to read the book, The Naked Anabaptist by Stuart Murray. Is, has anyone picked that book up yet? I mean, it is. Isn't it a breath of fresh air? And doesn't it make you go like, oh, this is totally Woodland Hills. I mean, I mean this is Woodland Hills. This is what you're about and what you do. It's, I, I think if I was you, I would, be, I would feel very encouraged. But even not being a part of Woodland Hills, as I read it, I find it very encouraging because Stuart Murray argues that uh, Christianity is in the middle of a turning that from Constantine all the way to the end of the 20th century, uh, we were in an era where Christianity was at the center of society, where uh, because Constantine mandated Christianity to be a part of the empire, parts of Christianity and parts of the state or the empire got fused. And so Christianity actually, by being placed in the center of power, paradoxically lost its power. And so have you felt people getting anxious in the last maybe 20 or 30 years about getting back to that time when it felt like Christianity was at the center of all things. You know what I'm talking about, right? When people, people start to freak out, we got to get back to that. we got to get back to those good old days when everyone knew what it meant to be a Christian, when, in essence, Christianity was sort of mandated. But Stuart Murray argues Christianity actually loses its power. Christianity actually works at its best when it's moving from the center to the margins of life. And this story, I think, illustrates it beautifully. So Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, this is my paraphrase of what I think it would have sounded like if the guy that was lame wrote it. One day, I was being carried up to the temple gate at the time of prayer, actually a little before the time of prayer, so that People would see me as they were going in and maybe give me some money. And that's what I did every day. I ask everyone for money. Sometimes 
I get a little, and that's the way every day goes, but on this day, something really different happened. I asked two guys for money, like I always do, and both of them stopped. They looked straight at me. And the loud one... (laughs) Peter said, look at us, and I was shocked because you guys... Um, no one looks at me. So I gave them my attention, hoping for something a little extra. I was hungry. Question. Have you ever been there? What does it mean to be carried up? to a place where you have to sit down, in fact, lay down, and ask for something. What does it mean to be so dependent on other people that they won't even look at you? Have you ever been there? Now, I want to argue that one of, the, um, one of the parts of our culture that actually we're kind of proud of is that we hate being there. We work really hard to not be there. Amen? We work really hard to show that piggy bank and go, I would much rather be in a place of offering than being at a place where I need something. Right? I mean, this is me anyway. And it really is hard for me to come to a place where I say, what I have to offer maybe isn't even necessary. And actually, I'm in a place where I need. So let's go back to this story. This guy who's laying at the temple gate called Beautiful. Well, the loud one, that is Peter said, Silver silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking me by the right hand, he helped me up. And I felt something I'd never felt before in my life. I felt my legs underneath me. Can you imagine what that would have felt like on that day that actually happened in the actual universe? So then things got really crazy. I don't actually remember much of it. Apparently, I jumped to my feet, and I began to walk. And then, you guys, I went with them into the temple courts, into a place I had never been allowed to be. I went with them. You know what? I was walking. But I wasn't only walking. I was jumping. And I wasn't only jumping. I was praising God. Can you imagine seeing that sight? Going into the temple to pray. The guy that you just passed is now walking and jumping and leaping and praising God. The leaders that were in charge of making sure the order of service went according to schedule were probably starting to freak out. This is not in the order of service. We've never seen this before. And Peter and John are just going, we we were just coming up for prayer. I mean, I don't even know what happened totally. And I wonder if Peter, on the inside, because Peter had something to offer. I mean, Peter was a leader. He was a speaker. Earlier on in Acts, he spoke, and 3,000 people came to believe in Jesus, so he was persuasive. But I wonder if Peter, as he passed by that guy on that day, laying by the temple gate called Beautiful, I wonder if he looked down and said, you know what, in many ways, that's me. Not that used to be me, but that's me right now. Without the power of the risen Christ in me, I have nothing to offer. And so in a moment, I wonder if Peter, filled with God's Spirit, just said, 
I really do have something to offer, and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. And I'm going to reach my right hand down and give it to him because the risen Christ has given something to me. And he gave it to me when I was at my bottom. Remember what Peter did? I mean, before he denied Christ, remember Jesus actually called him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. That wouldn't be my highest day as a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? That wouldn't be the day that I email my mom and say, today was awesome. Jesus called me Satan. And then, of course, you know Peter, in in a moment of despair and hopelessness, denied Jesus, denied knowing Jesus. But in a way, you you have to wonder, in a way, Jesus knew, Peter knew Jesus, but the Jesus that Peter would come to know, the risen Jesus, it was like he really didn't know that Jesus yet. It took coming to a place of brokenness and emptiness for Peter, where his piggy bank was broke op- broken wide open and empty, for him to realize, oh my goodness, there is so much more. Because when you are empty and when you have nothing, that is the moment where Jesus can fill you with himself. So question, I'm a little meddlesome with my questions. I hope you don't mind. And even if you do mind, I guess I don't care that much because I think they help. (laughs) Question, where do you bring your own woundedness? Where do you bring your emptiness? Now, picture uh, picture yourself walking into the temple, so to speak, and you get the gift of seeing yourself in your wounded condition. I mean, this is sort of a weird... Uh, uh, picture, but what if you could see yourself in your wounded condition, in all of the woundedness and brokenness that you actually have? What would you do, and what do you do when you see yourself like that, when you enter into a moment where you come face to face with your brokenness, with your emptiness, with maybe even your own sin? I'm going to argue that uh, some of us Look at it, and we just, we walk right by. We ignore it. We numb out. That's the time to take one more drink. That's the time to have a little more sex. That's the time to study a little more. That's the time to get more busy. That's the time to dive into work. That's the time to get codependent. Anything other than facing my own woundedness. Anyone there? I'm going I'm to ignore it. Others of us, I think, uh, over-identify and overindulge our wounded nature, but we never pick that wounded nature up and bring it to Jesus for healing. And we just stay there and we camp there, and it's like we, that's where we get energy from this wounded victim place. Where do you bring your woundedness? What if you had the courage to, in a moment of dependence, To look down at your wounded self and say, I'm bringing you to Jesus now. Because I got nothing left to offer you, and no one else does either. It's time for you to meet with Jesus so at the end of yourself, you can actually be filled. This is what happens in the text, and you can read so many things into this beautiful verse, but Acts chapter 3, verse 8 We read these words, he, that is the guy that was formerly lame, jumped to his feet and began to walk. And, you know, we've all read this before, so we're like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm." But, I mean, this is radical. This is crazy what just happened. Then he went with them into the temple courts, a place that he'd never been before in his life because he wasn't allowed to go in there because he was unclean. He was walking and jumping and praising God. And the first thing we need to see about that is that's a picture of the kingdom of Jesus that I think the Anabaptists celebrate so wonderfully that we are at our best when those on the margins see themselves as whole people and are included into the center of the community of Jesus. That people in their actual lives, people on the margins especially, get invited to have a seat around the table 
and we can sit and eat together and learn from each other and offer all the beautiful things we have to offer each other around that table. That's the picture of the kingdom of Jesus, rich and poor, young and old, male and female, all different ethnicities sitting around, learning from each other, offering what we have to each other, centered around the person of Jesus. And that's what this verse is speaking of. But the other thing I think it's speaking of in more subtle terms is when a person, a singular person, has the courage to say, I'm going to pick up my wounded self, and I'm going to integrate that wounded self into the self that has something to offer, and we're all going to go into the presence of Jesus because that's the way that Jesus fills us, and that's the way that we have authority in the world. When we come as broken, wounded people, that say, I once was blind, but now I see. That is my story that I testify to, that there is a new creation that sprung up out of this old barren ground, and it's because of the presence and the power of the risen Christ. Henry Now, and any Henry Now and fans in the house? I love Henry Nouwen. He wrote this in his book, Wounded Healer. The paradox of Christian leadership is that the way out is the way in. I don't even know what that means, but it's just so mysterious and beautiful that I thought I'd put it up there. No, here's what it means. That only by entering into communion with human suffering can relief be found. You ever been sitting there with someone who is in need? And all of a sudden, on the inside, you're like, I, I, you feel that your piggy bank is empty and you have nothing left to offer, and you start to freak out a little bit? Is there like, I, got, I, got, I don't got anything else. I don't got anything else. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, here, let me, let me. And, 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 then, you, and then pretty soon, you're on, on a puddle in the floor because what you had ran out. And they weren't even that grateful for what you gave. Thank you very much. Henry Nouwen is saying it's only when you actually enter into the human suffering of another human being that relief can be found. And the only way to do that is by coming in touch with your own suffering, not ignoring it, not overly indulging it, but meeting it face to face and reaching your hand down and picking it up and saying in the presence of Jesus, we're going in together and we're going in for healing because that's the only way that we will have any kind of authority in the world. So what does it mean to be a wounded healer? We, we like to just be the healer. You know? I mean, the bigger the better. Well, I, I, after the service last night, one of my friends was here, and she was telling me about her involvement in an organization that helps women that are in prostitution and human trafficking. And uh, I'm telling you, this, this, this issue right here is finally, I think, getting some press. And it needs to because something needs to be done about it. And I also wonder if God is not perhaps saying, hey, those are my daughters and sons in there. We got to do something. So um, this organization is doing something. And it's led by this woman who's... Um, building relationships with city officials and legislatures, and uh, she also has, happens to have the power of Jesus coursing through her veins. Well, you know her story is, this, this woman that leads this organization? For 31 years, she was a prostitute. And she is now a wounded healer. Your authority in your life is at the place of your, where your deepest wound has met the healing of Jesus Christ, and you stand up into that healing, you have something to offer. Uh, one of the things that I find hilarious is that um, for years and years as a kid, I was a horrible stutterer. I mean, I could not talk. And when you stutter, it's really... It's weird because people, they don't know how to interact with you. 
they sort of try to finish your sentences. They get super anxious, which makes you super anxious, which makes you stutter even more. It's awful. So if any of you are stutterers or were stutterers, you just know it's like this weird thing that no one really talks about. It's like one of these deals. So anyway, every time I'm sitting, wherever I'm sitting, down here or at Open Door or wherever I'm speaking, and I, I usually remember, I'm a stutterer. And I go, God, what in the world are you thinking? <laughs> Putting me on a stage to have me speak to people. And it's like the answer I most frequently get is God just kind of goes, it's kind of what I do. I love to use weakness. God says, I love to use weakness so that my strength can sh be shown in all of its glory. Church of Woodland Hills, as you discover and rediscover your kindred tribe, what you need to know is that I think the beautiful gift of this turning that's happening in our culture around Christianity that I think the Anabaptists are seeing so clearly is that now maybe more than more than's happened in the last 1500 years there's an opportunity for weakness to be shown as strength because as Christianity moves more and more to the margins and as we move more and more to a post-Christian world, the opportunity that exists there is that people who are not pastors and theologians, people who are living their normal, actual life, who are willing to put their brokenness and emptiness up for God to heal them, those people on the margins are starting to stand up, and though that is how the kingdom of Jesus will spread in this next turning. I am convinced of it. And so my role as a speaker is to call it out and say, people of Woodland Hills, live your actual life in all of its ordinariness, but bring your emptiness to Jesus so that it can be in the process of healing. And you know that's a process, right? It's incremental. It's slow. It's a journey. But the more you're willing to bring your woundedness to Jesus and have it be in the process of being healed, the more authority you will have in the world and the more the kingdom of Jesus will grow in mustard seed ways from the outside in. And it's going to be beautiful. And I think... That's one of the reasons why I'm just, I'm, I'm on the outside looking in, and I'm excited for you guys as you kind of re-embrace, or as you actually embrace something that's really a part of your DNA anyway. So I'm watching, and I think a lot of people are, and this is exciting. It's very exciting for the kingdom. The hope of the world is in Jesus Christ, and that hope is shining very, very brightly right now. Contrary to all the, you know, numbers you read about all the stuff and it fills you with fear and anxiety, Jesus Christ is alive and active in God's people and Jesus is building his church. Amen. So that's, that's good, right? Amen? Amen? Okay. So what does it look like to be a wounded healer? Isaiah 53 paints a picture of the wounded healer himself, Jesus this is from the message, and I love this description because it's not what we think of when we think about Jesus, blue hair, blonde eyes, blue sash, flowing robes. This is how Isaiah prophesied about Jesus years before he was born. The servant, Jesus, grew up before God. I like this description. It's what I would put on my resume. Um, no, no, it isn't. Uh, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There's nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look Note that church of Jesus Christ, body of Christ, who is to look like Jesus in the world. If you look like a scrawny seedling, amen. <laughs> you look just like Jesus. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him. We thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us, we thought that he brought it on himself, that it was God who was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped 
and tore and crushed him. It was our sins. He took the punishment. And that is what made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. Jesus is the wounded healer, and it's his image that we bear. Amen? It's his image that we bear. So God bless you. You are blessed by God when you come to the end of your piggy bank. When you are on the, in the fetal position on the floor freaking out because you don't know what to do with a world that has such crazy need, that's when God comes to you and says, okay, now we can work because you've run out. Now you can enter into the human condition. Now you can enter into suffering because you know that only Jesus can heal and you can befriend a person as they walk toward Jesus and you can listen and you can be a voice of uh, hope because you have your own story of healing. Of a process, right? Ruth Haley Barton writes this, and I love this quote, Uh, the possibility that human beings can be transformed to such such an extent that we actually image Christ is central to the message of the gospel and to the mission of the church. And so what that means is, and this is so Anabaptist, she is not an Anabaptist in, in name, but she is in this quote and in spirit. That means that it must be possible for us to begin to look more and more like Jesus or else the mission of the church will be horribly uh, pushed, pushed back. It is possible for us to be transformed into looking more and more like Jesus. And the way that we do that is to get in touch with our woundedness and our brokenness, bringing them to Jesus day by day and place by place. So I think about that in my own life. And the question comes, what do you have to offer Isn't that a meddlesome question? But what if we got the man that Peter and John healed up here on this stage and asked him that question? What do you have to offer? I wonder what he would say. In fact, I don't wonder what he would say. He might say, well, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a job. Um... But what I do have is the power of the risen Jesus Christ of Nazareth coursing in me, and that's what I offer people. And I'm convinced in the first century, though Peter and John and Paul and others were the spokespeople of Christianity, I am convinced that the way the kingdom of Jesus and the community of Jesus grew was that people like this guy who was formerly lame just went around and talked about it and said, I once was lame, but now I walk. And it's, that's not even the greatest part about my story. I once was lost, and now I am found. And that's how the kingdom of Jesus spread in the first century. And in the 21st century, as we approach this turning that the Anabaptists are talking about, that's the way it will spread in the 21st century. Ordinary, actual people having stories of healing in their own lives, just walking around and being who they are and talking when necessary and looking at people in the eyes and loving people. Well, when I think about that, I think about moving into the areas of the world that frankly feel pretty dark And I do start to freak out a little bit. I don't know if you do. Do you? There's a lot of need. And so the question is, like, God, when I start moving out into those crazy areas, the areas of darkness, are you going to be there to meet me? Now, that's an honest question that you've got to wrestle with, isn't it? And, like, in my own life, I mean, really, I live in Maple Grove, you know, so... I, I go, God, I'm not even going to go to the darkest corners of Maple Grove, but I might go to a foggy corner like in Byerly's, you know? <laughs> and that's about where I'm at, click by click. And um, in that foggy area, God, because I'm not even ready to go to the dark, but in the foggy area, it, you know, okay, may, okay maybe cup, okay? I can, I can go to cup. <laughs> Kidding. Um, 
Are you going to meet me there, God? And so I want to read in closing these last verses to you. And it's up to you whether you think this is just magical thinking or fairy dust or wishful thinking or if it's what we're going to push all of our chips in the middle of the table on as a church who's trying to reach into the dark areas of the world. When you do that, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 8 through 11 says, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways. I love the word astonishing. You could also call that delightful, creative, amazing, extravagant. Awesome. Thank you. Now we're preaching. (laughs) So that you're ready for anything and everything, even in the foggy corners of Byerly's, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist puts it, he throws, God throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy in reckless abandon. What if that was the mission statement of a church? We give to the needy in reckless abandon. Because we're just doing what God does. Well, if you did that, some of you accountants are like, well, okay, that's going to cost something. I mean, where are we going to get that? Well, God's right living, right giving will never run out, will never wear out. So this most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than extravagant with you. He gives you something you can then give away. What's the pattern when you walk into situations of need? What's the pattern? He gives you something so that you can then give it away. That's always the pattern. Or else you have nothing to give, amen? And sometimes you do have nothing to give. It's like, okay, we got nothing to give. But if God gives you something, you give it away. That's how the world gets changed, which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, I love that word, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us great praise to God. That is a song that requires like huge subs and electric guitars and cymbals, and that is the song that we need to listen to moment by moment if we're going to become a kind of people who live on the margins and believe that Jesus will meet us in those dark areas. Amen? We have to believe that, that there is a God who is reckless in God's generosity, that we have a God who will never run out, that we have a God who gives enough. Amen. We live in a world of scarcity. We think scarcity, there's not enough, there's never enough. And sometimes we can even rebound over into abundance. Oh, there's so much. Enough is what God brings. God brings enough. So Church of Woodland Hills, what are you hungry for? And what do you have to offer? My prayer for you is that you more and more come into touch with your brokenness and your woundedness and you bring that to Jesus, that is the most counter-cultural thing you can do in this culture that insists what you have to offer is what you have to offer. What you have to offer is the fullness that comes in a person's life when they say, I am empty and all I have is you and Jesus, you're the sweetest name I know. Amen? Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? Let me pray a benediction over you as you leave. You ready for this? And God is able. You could could just write those three words. That can get you through the next year. But I have more. God is able to do. God is able to give you everything you need. So that at all times, in all things, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Well, God bless you guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much for having me. I loved it. So great.